covering GPs uh, globally out of an office in Riyadh is, is not an easy task. So what we do is we rely on kind of five different methods of, of covering uh, GPs. So uh, the first method is that we subscribe to a database, um, such as Prequin, which provides you basically access a lot of information on GPs um, internationally. I don't, it doesn't cover everything, um, but it covers, I think, a good swath of the market. Um, we, what we also like to do is we look at consultants. So sometimes we have special consultants that can, um, uh, that might be plugged into family offices, plugged into um, sovereign wealth funds, and a lot of times they can pick up certain GPs that they don't need to raise money uh, from external investors, so they're not going to be on a pre-point, right? So you can kind of find additional GPs that way. Uh, a third method is really through um, strategic alliances. And what I mean by that is that, you know, sitting in the Middle East, we have expertise in the Middle East. So if an investor in Malaysia wants to invest in the Middle East, they can talk to us. Similarly, if we want to invest in Malaysia or Indonesia, it's good to have a relationship with a friend out there. So in certain parts of the world, we have these relationships. So that if I want to go to Korea, I speak with a Korean uh, manager that we have a relationship with and it can help out. Um, the fourth method is really just getting on a plane and, and flying out, visiting the countries. And what we'll do is we'll spend a couple of days speaking with almost all the major players. But then what we'll also try to do is uh, speak with certain new managers that might have spun out from an existing player that was really good. And that way we can cover both exist, you know, existing and new managers. And the fifth method is really just attending conferences like Super Return. So uh, Super Return has sessions, conferences I should say, globally. You know? And so you attend the Hong Kong uh, session, you're going to find many different GPs in, in Geneva or San Francisco or Oh, well, that would be all the different other places. So those are the five methods. Right now, we're most excited about um, Southeast Asia. And the reason is, is that, first of all, Southeast Asia is, is rather large. I mean, people don't realize that it's got about 600 million people, right? So it's bigger than the Eurozone. It's bigger than the European Union in terms of people. Um, and what's happening right now is that these economies are typically uh, younger uh, economies, younger, uh, uh, younger average age population. They're fast growing, right? And what's really beneficial is that uh, in 1997, they had a, a major banking financial crisis. So what happened was they learned from the, that crisis, they prepared themselves better, they instituted laws, they made sure the banks were much better um, were solved and make sure they had better assets and uh, therefore they're much likelier to their strong their stronger position today as a result so I would tell you that Southeast Asia uh, and when I say that I, I mean countries like Indonesia Malaysia Thailand Philippines Vietnam Singapore's developed but it's it's uh, uh, still part of the group uh, so those countries as a group are, are very beneficial and one thing I might add is that uh, they've decided to come together as, in terms of like an economic community. That's what they call it. So what that means is they are looking to have, you know, a free flow of, of trade, of labor, of, of capital, of services uh, across the borders. It, it, basically like the European Union. However, the difference is, is that they have not uh, uh, adopted a common currency. So in other words, they kind of learned some of the mistakes, let's say, that maybe the European Union has made. So they, they'll keep their current, the, each, the different currencies, but if the trade barriers go to zero, they're going to have a lot more trading, right, between each other. So I think that the ASEAN region, we've invested already public equity, we've invested private equity, and we've, we've been, even invested in real estate in Southeast Asia. I think it will do very well in the next five or ten years. In terms of standing out, you know, I, I give, um, it, it, it's not one criteria, that's, that's, that's the thing I think that, because uh, I've been asked before by GPs um, what they can do to increase their uh, standing in front, of, uh, in front of LPs like ourselves. I think that it's a combination of factors that really 
uh, differentiates a GP in, in our mind. So for, for me, the, the first thing that we look at that is really important is strategy. Strategy is something that people give a lot of lift service to, but they don't, um, very few understand it properly. So sometimes if, if, if I flip through some of these presentations, I'll see these, uh, strategy of, you know, we like to buy companies cheaply and we sell them at a high price, which is very generic. It doesn't tell me very much at all. When I, when I say strategy, I, I'm talking about how, how exactly do you achieve value creation? How are you different? What, 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 is, what is it that you're doing? So, yeah, it's very important. And one thing that's good about strategy is that it tells you what you don't do. So I like it when a manager says, you know, we, we don't do this sector, we don't do these kind of companies, we don't, we don't know that. We focus on this. So that when, I, when I hear that, I understand that, okay, this is someone who is, is at least focused or understanding of what they're good at. Um, beyond strategy, you know, I mean, the other factors is that as we personally, this is uh, specific to our firm, is that we prefer managers that are typically um, uh, owned by management. Uh, you know, we don't like the bulge brackets. Uh, we prefer managers, obviously, that put a, a fair amount of skin in the game. Uh, I mean, every now and then there might be an exception where the manager is uh, just have, have, may have come out from like a bank or something and they don't have the wealth to put a lot of money into the product. But otherwise, you really, we really, really want to see a lot of commitment uh, from the GB. I mean, obviously, turnover among the team. I mean, there, there, there's so many soft factors which. Uh, can speak to other issues. You see what I'm saying? So turnover in the team can be a sign of other stresses that you may not find through a typical type of analysis. And then the other factors are things like, you know, the loss ratio, hit ratio, how, how many of the investments have they been profitable on versus losing on. You know, we definitely want to see that there isn't a few return, few companies that are really cooling the performance uh, and, and, you know, and are accounting for the lion's share of the gains. Uh, so I, I think those are some of the main ways that GP can differentiate themselves in our eyes. Sure, so, you know, we're based in the Middle East, and for GPs that are looking to raise money in the Middle East, they should be aware that not all Middle Eastern uh, LPs are the same. And you have really a, a split among conventional uh, LPs and, and uh, Sharia compliant LPs. So uh, conventional LPs are just basically LPs that will invest in pretty much anything, right? They're, they're not, they don't have necessarily certain constraints. And, and, and the conventional LPs are going to be your sovereign wealth funds, uh, your pension funds, right? And government type uh, funds are, are typically in that category. So those are the conventional funds uh, where a, a GP's um, product may not, need, may not need to be tailored. Now, you also have in the Middle East uh, Sharia compliant funds. It's actually not only in the Middle East, it's also in Southeast Asia. Uh, but basically, these are funds that are, or these are LPs that are uh, going to have certain constraints when they invest. And I, I, I categorize their constraints in, in three categories. So, uh, one, one of those is sector constraints. So uh, Sharia compliant LPs will not invest in uh, specific sectors such as uh, financial services, um, such as uh, tobacco, alcohol, casino, hospitality. Uh, those sectors, they will be off limits. So obviously if you peddle a product and you, don't, and, and you have these exposures and you don't understand who you're talking to, it's already going to be a... Uh, the, 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 actually most LP when someone comes to us and talks to us and they don't even know the, the first thing about Sri investing, it's a turn off. Um, secondly, the, the, the second constraint is, is leverage. So uh, typically what is happening is that the uh, LPs will have, the Sri compliant LPs will require that no more than 33% uh, debt to enterprise value uh, in the portfolio companies that the GP invests in. So it's a, it's a general kind of leverage, uh, and that applies across industries. You know, they want to see lower, lower gear, lower leverage companies. And the, and the third factor is the um, we call financial instrument, which means that when a GP invests in a company, uh, they typically could invest in by preferred shares, or they might invest through certain types of uh, convertible debentures, convertible debt, with have, have interest rates. So anytime that um, 
a GP invest with a, a method that uses interest, like a convertible to Mitchell, which has an interest rate attached, then it would be off limits. So those are the three kind of major categories that would define, I would say, the Sharia uh, LPs. And those would include family offices, a lot of family offices in the Middle East. Those would include high, high net worth individuals. So if you ever want to partner with a bank and offer the product to the general population, you need to be aware of these constraints.